after chapter five past seven. So, um, and we'll be recording tonight as well, which is which is great. So, mm -hmm. so let, let's kick off with a uh, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa, Fulcharov. Um, really great to have you all here uh, this evening. I know I'm very much looking forward to this um, uh, to this fireside chat with some pretty pretty special people. Mm. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that don't know, my name is Brendan O'Connell. Um, I do some work here with the Irish Business Network, um, also with Enterprise Ireland, and with an Irish company called I Am Here, who have a uh, mental well-being program for for workplaces. Mm. Um, one of the main tenants of of I Am Here and and many other really solid pieces of work out there in uh, in the mental health space is is the belief that it's it's okay not to feel okay, and it's absolutely okay to ask for help. So if anybody listening in tonight or listening to the recording. Uh, um, um, on this topic of mental health, feel like you do want a bit of support, um, really recommend, even if you're just thinking about it, just to call or text 1737 mm -hmm. uh, as a first line of support. And if you'd like to speak to an Irish voice, uh, I know that Fiona and the team at Friends of Ireland on the wellbeing site uh, have an option there to, to request a call from one of the type of accents that you'll be hearing tonight from, um, from these folks. So if you feel like reaching out, um, um, please, please do that. Please do reach out. It's absolutely okay to ask for help. Um, thanks, Fiona, for putting all this together as part of the Friends of Ireland Wellbeing Program. Um, really great to have this, mm. be able to have the chance to have this fireside chat tonight. And I know I'm looking forward to it. Mm. Um, throughout the session, if anybody has any questions, feel free just to use the um, Q and A button down below there and ask questions, and we'll look at getting toward getting to those um, throughout the night. So, um, um, so put them there. Um, and we are tonight going to be hearing from uh, um, Fiona Dehan from uh, Car Consulting and Friends of Ireland, and she'll tell us a little bit about the um, the wellbeing survey that we're, that was done by Friends of Ireland. Mm. Um, we'll hear from Dara Sheridan, um, who's the um, um, uh, at, at High Performance Sport and looking after high performance coaching at at, at Sport, and from Kevin Hurl uh, from Titan Wellness. So. We're looking forward to a great chat, and maybe we'll just kick things off, Fiona. If yeah. if you could tell us a little bit about the the wellbeing program and the survey, I know I was fascinated to see the level of response mm. um, that you had, which was great, yeah. uh, and some really good insights there. How did how did that go? Yeah, absolutely, Brendan. Uh, thank you very much um, for agreeing to um, for all three of you to agreeing to join me for this chat this evening. Um, I really appreciate you and the knowledge and experiences that you bring. Um, to everyone else, uh, kia ora, horda. Um, um, I guess um, a little bit of, you, you know, you, you will have read a bit about the project on the website um, um, when you were going on to register for, for this. But in short, I mean, it really was just around partnering with the embassy and the Irish organisations in New Zealand um, to find tangible ways that we could um, support the community here at this time. And, you know, when I got involved with the project first, my, my first instinct was like, yeah, you know, there is great knowledge out there and lots of great resources, but let's not make any assumptions about what our community needs at this time. Let's make sure that this is a truly by community for community project, um, which is exactly why we put that survey out there. However, like anything else, um, like any survey, you know, I had expectations. I thought, oh, you know, if I get 30 or 40 responses, I'll be absolutely delighted, you know, to, to get that. But little did I know or expect to get um, along the lines of 230 responses. I was absolutely blown away. Uh, from a demographic perspective, um, there definitely was a higher split on the female side of things. And I think I can probably attribute that though um, to the Irish Mammies group. However, I also do think as well that that group and that demographic um, of, of women that responded will also have captured a lot of, um, a lot of those women have families and have partners and have children. So I do think that they will have also even if their partners didn't respond, I think in a lot of those cases, they will have been responding for the family. So we will have captured a lot of the data um, that is what is impacting um, our, the men in our community as well. But yeah, absolutely blown away by that response. And, you know, the, the, what people told us about what the needs were, um, we've used that to inform the resource hub and this wellbeing webinar series. So the topics, you know, we've had so far is dealing with bereavement, um, grief and trauma. Um, we've had we've had uh, the first part of a two-part uh, around financial 
about personal finance because people have spoken about a concern about um, managing finances um, at this time as well. And what we can all do with getting a bit better about that and learning about that personally. I definitely learned a few ooh, moments when I listened to Nigel speak at that. Um, and then, um, you know, we have others coming up around dealing with uncertainty and change. We have another one specifically around parenting. And that's not it. There is a couple of more in train as well. So that's, that kind of gives you an idea of, of how we've used the data to inform this resource hub, to inform this project. And, you know, we, we still want to keep hearing about the needs that you see that are there or the resources that you see that might be helpful for our community. So please feel free to get in touch. Um, yeah, that's all for me for now. Thank you, Brendan. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Fiona. Great, great, great way to start a project like this as well, doing that, doing that check-in. And it was, it was quite, at one level, it was probably quite encouraging to see the level of understanding um, um, that was out there around, around mental health. There was some really great, great feedback across mm -hmm. all of that, across all that material. So, so yeah. yeah, great way to start. And obviously, it's informing a lot of the work that you're doing now uh, in yeah. partnership with the embassy um, around this program. So, mm -hmm. yeah, good, 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 good to see it. Um, so the, when when we sort of talked about what to what to how to structure tonight and how to cover, it, we knew that we had a couple of great stories and some great experience from um, from Dara and Kevin. So there's quite a bit of of look at, at some personal stories around what's what, what's worked for each of us at different times. And Kevin and and Dara are going to go through that. And so I'll introduce Dr. Dara Sheridan. He'll probably do a much better job of introducing uh, himself. All 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 I'll cover is the. The fascinating piece that he's a he's a Galway man here in in New Zealand working with High Performance Sport New Zealand uh, in the really fascinating role of high performance coaching in that environment. So um, you know it's all about performance uh, um, and look forward to hearing from uh, what that experience has been like for you, Dara. Thanks a million, Brandon, and and uh, thank you everyone for this for this opportunity to. I guess um, share and connect regarding um, you know an area which I think is challenging everyone right now. When you look at the demands now that people are being asked to contend with, obviously with COVID acting as an accelerator of all things, good and bad, um, I think never before has there been a requirement for people to um, share that experience, um, share the challenges, share the what works of that experience so that so that ultimately people can navigate this new terrain and this new reality um, with skill, with awareness um, and with um, responsibility. And I guess in, in part of what I want to share, I guess, in this 50 minute slot is in my world in high performance sport, um, it's a world that's typically characterized by strength, speed, power, um, it's t typically, I guess, um, all, all of the characteristics of masculinity, um, which is that people are strong, people are focused, people are resilient. Uh, um, and for somebody who's been working kind of in that industry for the best part of 20 years as an athlete, a, a coach, uh, and more recently as a leader, um, last year for me was a really, really challenging year, which I'd, I'd really like to share, I guess, a piece of that with, mm. with people. Um, on the grounds that um, in my lifetime, I've, I've, I guess, spent a significant amount of my life, maybe half of my life, committed to excellence and committed to always trying to achieve my very best, my very best potential and, and, and kind of those around me. So um, I'll give a, a small bit of um, background context. Um, I guess I arrived over here in New Zealand October two years ago and um, the role that I I guess saw it was to become the leader of high performance coaching in New Zealand, which is everything from you're looking at the 150, 160 um, elite coaches you see in New Zealand on your TV at the weekend are all part of the remit. And I lead a team of five people inside a crown entity that supports that workforce in terms of how they're identified, how they're developed, how they're ultimately retained um, so that athletes get the best experiences so that they can ultimately win for New Zealand on the world stage. And prior to that, I came from uh, Ireland where I spent 10 years doing pretty much the same role. But when I moved to New Zealand, I moved to New Zealand because I really wanted to be part of something that was world leading. Um, and kind of the, the second reason for coming to New Zealand was, you know, my wife, Jean, three kids under the age of seven, really just to give them a different life experience. And 
when I first came down to New Zealand between October of 2018 and December 2018, I didn't come down with my wife and my children. Um, and I'd literally 12 weeks of, um, I guess, a disconnection from family and friends. And I guess when you move to, to the other part of the world and you don't know people, that was a demand and a stress that I'd never witnessed. Um, e even though I'd came through a whole host of other experiences where I'd lived in the UK, um, you know, I'd experienced a, a pretty challenging retirement as an athlete. I've worked with multiple people that have been in that space, but there I was, I guess, in a new country um, by my own will and desire, um, but beginning to experience a new set of demands, which I'd never um, experienced before, trying to find a house, trying to get a car and trying to get all of these things but also moving into an organization that um, had gone through a recent restructure um, or developing a new ambitious strategy to bring New Zealand sport onto a whole new level. Um, and when I arrived into that personal and professional reality, uh, and then my wife and my kids came over um, after the Christmas period, it literally um, made a massive dent in my capacity not only to perform as a performer, but also to live. And I guess we think of capacity as the, the energy to, to perform. When you look up, look, look up any physics book, the, the, the definition of um, energy is the capacity to perform. And what I'd found was that these demands were having such an impact on me is that I couldn't regenerate my capacity quick enough to really keep my head above water. And, uh, um, so there I was in this new organization that was going through a rapid transformation, which I wasn't really tuned into when I actually took the role um, and on a visa where, you know, you know, to retain the visa, I had to stay working, um, I guess, in my current employer, um, single income. So I had all of these pressures coming at me as not only a dad, but also um, as a husband. And really for me, the tipping point came last September in Father's Day, when, um, you know, typically in my house, we share the sleep in on a rotation on a Saturday or a Sunday between myself and my wife. And my three kids come into the room on Father's Day with um, these lovely gifts. And such was the fatigue that I'd um, experienced literally on the 11th or 12th month uh, in the role, is that when the gifts landed in the bed, I couldn't feel the gifts. I was so tired. I was so devoid of energy is I couldn't actually feel their emotion. And it really upset me to the point that I, I, I knew that I got to a really dangerous point, um, I guess, in my experience with well-being, where I'd lost the ability to sense and to feel my own family. And that's a pretty frightening space to get to, um, I guess, when you lose, when you lose that ability and, and, um, I'd literally been working incredibly hard hours for a number of months, um, not only to meet the demands of the role, but to meet the demands of the family moving to New Zealand. And literally, um, my response from that was just to make my employer aware that, you know, the role and the demands just weren't sustainable. Um, I went on a period of leave for the guts of about three weeks. Um, and literally, I, I, I guess the following Monday after um, Father's Day, you know, my wife frog marched me into a GP. She was that concerned. Um, and I didn't have a relationship with a GP in New Zealand. So I didn't have a medical record here in New Zealand either, just regarding my own blood pressure, uh, my own bloods, my, my own basic picture of health hadn't been formed or established with any um, practitioner in New Zealand. And it became really, really clear that the vast majority of my problem was just um, fatigue, um, but fatigue to a dangerous point where I'd lost the ability to regulate my own emotions, my ability to see right. And I was in a, I guess you'd classify as a, a, a dangerous, a dangerous downward spiral. Um, I guess in, 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 in kind of coming out of that, there were a couple of things that I stopped doing. So I stopped consuming alcohol. I started to do some really, really light physical exercise during the weeks um, that I was off. Um, my friendship network just really, really kicked into a whole new gear where two or three of my, when well, my two brothers and my best friend formed like this, almost like um, a trust triangle around me where they helped me to break the siege that I was in by ensuring, well, listen, mate, like if it doesn't work in New Zealand, you can always come home. We'll support you in whatever you need financially or logistically um, around that. Uh, and I guess having my friends who know me best to enable me to find my way back, <clears throat> excuse me, to who I really was. Um, when you take away 
the warped impact that the fatigue um, was ultimately um, having on me. And, and when I eventually found my voice and I guess my um, courage with my employer, it gave me an opportunity to actually begin to recraft and to change my role so that those demands weren't having the impact that they were, they were, um, that they were ultimately, ultimately having, having on me. So um, I guess the upside from that, I, I, I guess when I, when I, when I, um, when I look back at, 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 at some lessons learned from it, one was when I came into this role, um, the reality is I, there was a whole host of assumptions and illusions. Um, and when I lost control, a sense of control and a sense of security in my reality, I became very uncomfortable with that groundless experience. And I guess that's part of what COVID is teaching me is that nothing is permanent. Life is hard. Um, I'm not as important as who I thought I was. Um, you know, there's other people in my life that are as important as me, i.e. my wife and my um, um, three children. And, and what the experience, I guess, when the bubble burst and that reality burst um, um, and when the rug was pulled um, from underneath me, my immediate re reaction was to actually work harder. My immediate reaction was not to address the root cause of what was causing all of the fatigue and the demands, which were having a huge impact uh, on my lifestyle uh, and my, 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 my way of living. So, um, you know, I think um, Brene Brown makes a really good point around boundaries when she, when she says, choose discomfort over resentment. So what, what I wasn't prepared to do was have the hard conversations with, I guess, my boss around protecting my boundaries around not only my family life, but my own, I guess, health as an individual. And, and that was a real key, key um, um, lesson, I guess, from, from, from my perspective. So I guess if I was to summar, summarize um, kind of what worked for me, um, one is the first thing I would say, have a relationship with your GP. Always maintain an accurate picture of your health. You know, simple set of bloods, blood pressure, um, and, a, and a medical or a mental health check, I think are absolutely critical. And, and certainly in the current environment, I'd be suggesting for somebody to do that every, every, every six months. The second point, I guess, is really around self-awareness or mindfulness is that um, when things do get hard and you do get squeezed or when things do get unbearable, what, what is your habitual reaction? Did you ever catch that? Um, is it to avoid? Is it to numb the challenge in terms of taking a drink? Is it to actually um, eat food that makes you feel more comfortable as opposed to actually addressing the reality um, that's around you? And I think one of the things that's made me really self-aware is, is that my basic ethos or um, um, kind of uh, philosophy on life has become more onto seeing change and constant change and the unpredictability around change as, as, as almost normal. And to be a lot less forgiving and open to um, the realities that are that are that are ultimately around us. But you can't actually respond to yourself if you don't set aside time to actually read these instincts and these natural ways in which we typically respond um, to some of the challenges that ultimately ultimately face us. So, for me, having a life ethos that is grounded, that is simplified, and that is ultimately, I guess. Um, driven by a set of principles or rules, I think is 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 really important. Um, so for me, I guess my daily routine, which is I guess a, a living discipline now, does involve, you know, a thirty minute min, um, uh, meditation in the morning between six and a half six, even before my family wake up. Um, I go to bed an hour earlier every night than what I used to, which means I get a, an hour's or a whole night's extra sleep every week because of that one decision to go to bed an hour earlier. Mm -hmm. That builds capacity. Um, I set aside time to play with my kids every evening. Um, I just got walloped there this evening with a whole host of lightsabers and from my kids who are into Star Wars at the moment. And I think the other really, really important thing is reading. Learn your way through these challenges. And I'm reading a couple of great books at the moment, Falling Upwards by Richard Rohr, which is a classic. Um, also reading a really good book from Pema Kadron just around when things fall apart. So two really, really great books, which really kind of, help us to, to deal with the challenges um, of life. And then the final thing I would suggest is have a tight team around you. Um, so my best friend and my soulmate is my wife, and we've got a very, very 
open relationship. I've got my two brothers back home in Ireland who I regularly maintain um, contact with. Uh, and I have two work colleagues that pretty much I know that have my back where I can get, I guess, whatever support or need that I have um, throughout, throughout any of the challenges um, that I face. So that's what worked um, for me. And I'm very fortunate to, I guess, um, you know, I'm, when you hit a wall like that, it takes a while to come back from that wall and to recover. So I'm still in recovery. Um, uh, um, and I'm not too sure, sure only for this experience last year, um, would I have the liberty to kind of do something like this this evening, which is just to gift that experience out there to others uh, and to say that, that this can happen to anyone. Uh, mm. uh, and there are a clear set of moves and a clear routine and a, and a discipline that if you, if, you, if you adhere to it, you can ultimately you know, absorb these stressors in life uh, and ultimately realize your potential and still make a contribution to your community. Because I think that's what well-being is about. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dar. Some, some great uh, nuggets in there uh, and some real generosity on your part to, um, to, to, share, that, to share that with us. Um, a couple of things that crossed my mind just would be good to hear about. You know, you talk about your, so I think you called it your, your triangle of trust between your two brothers and, and, uh, and your mate. Obviously, your wife is here and you have your work colleagues here who, who you mentioned. But I guess a lot of us here as, as Irish people for different lengths of time, you know, it's, it often means um, new networks and maybe, maybe separate from, uh, you know, family and other supports. How, how have you found, you know, being away from Ireland, being, being, being here and trying to build up networks and support for yourself? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I'd have to say, you know, the Irish Business Network probably two of my closest I did, sorry uh, I, I, I didn't actually intend yeah. this to be a party political broadcast <laughs> but, but since you've taken since you've taken that angle that's great <laughs> yeah no listen you know i met robert tig who's a fellow galwegian from Chum, who ironically just lives up the road and you know robert's turning out to be um to be to be a, a phenomenal friend that i met actually through that network so mm. um one of the things i would suggest is to connect in with these irish next networks because it does give you an opportunity to meet and it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that's um you know f from ireland um but it is really important and, and i think what mm. these connections do is give you another perspective on yourself and your situation because when you are the per when you are the self in that situation Mm. Um, and you're that fatigued, I guess, as I was trying to figure this out. I'd, I'd, I, you know, I'd lost my compass a bit, if I'm being truly honest. And, and what my friends did was give me the essential guidance to climb out of the pit and to set me on, 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 on a different direction with their support as well. Uh, um, and I think for me, the definition of a great friend is a great listener um, mm. and, and somebody who can hold your pain and your suffering and your challenge, um, not not kind of um, turn it into tr to trivialize it or to actually take it away from you, but just to hold it so that you can figure that out in, in their presence and in mm. their company. And, and so that triangle for me was really important in terms of breaking that siege. Mm. And I think a lot of the crises is around well-being. It's like you're the hostage taker, but you're also the hostage. And to break that siege, it's got to lead to a, a disclosure where you share that with somebody and once you share your plight with somebody, you break the siege. And that allows then another perspective, some love and some support to come around mm -hmm. you. And I think, I think that for me just highlighted the importance of having, you know, good friends, whether it's in Ireland or in New mm -hmm. Zealand, um, have just been critical, I guess, to my recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th thanks, thanks, Darren. And, and like I say, it wasn't intended to be a, a party political broadcast on behalf of the business network. But I must say, my own experience has been, um, you know, whilst I, ha I have some really good Kiwi friends, having people who have a, a really deep understanding of, of, of my humour and of my uh, and of my background has been really important to me over times in terms of uh, keeping a balance. So whether that happens to be a, a, a sports club, the Irish Society business network for it's it's definitely been something that's uh, that's worked for me and feeling more comfortable uh, away from my original home and in, in, in this home and so yeah interesting to hear that I'd, 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 Kevin I'd love to uh, I'd love to bring you in here and and uh, and hear from yourself so to everyone I'd like to introduce introduce Kevin Hurl um, 
He works uh, with Titan Wellness, an Irish business that do uh, um, well-being well-being programs for corporate environments, uh, and also has some interesting experiences. I expect from uh, his experience as a as a firefighter. So um, talk about pressure environments at times. And um, Kevin, love to love to hear a little bit about yourself. Yeah, look, uh, firstly, thanks, thanks very much, Dara, for sharing. And my, my own story, some of it mirrors yours quite, you know, eerily. And what I find from speaking to other, other people, other guys in the same position, there is, there is trends, there are patterns. And if you see it in yourself, look out for it in other people. Uh, you know, thanks to Brendan and Fiona for facilitating this. And it's, you know, again, it's an open platform. I think it's very, very good that we can actually get this stuff out. And hopefully, if it benefits one person, it's done its job. Uh, I suppose I'll, I'll start off with the same, the same format of who I am, but I also like to go over who I'm not. Uh, I moved to New Zealand almost nine years ago. I came from a project management background, uh, a lot of high stress environment in a, in a corporate sense. And when I came to New Zealand, uh, I wanted to change pace, but I ended up doing project management for earthquake repairs in Christchurch, uh, dealing with people who had been, you know, put out of their home or misplaced or whatever. And I also took on a, a role with the, the fire service as a, a volunteer firefighter in the local community. And I've been doing that for eight years, but in the last three years, I'm actually full-time firefighting in an aviation crash rescue. And as Brendan said, you know, it's, it, opens, it opens your eyes to the experiences that are out there, the pressures that you can come under. Uh, in Ireland, I was actually involved in search and rescue. And a lot of people would ask, oh, what does that involve? It usually involved two things. It was either finding dementia patients who had got lost, or it was finding other people who had gone to a very dark place to do something silly or something they were going to regret. So there was those two, two types of things. There was happy outcomes. And then there was people that had made bad decisions or bad choices based on their emotions or their environment or what they were feeling. So I was very aware of that, you know, that outcome. Uh, I said, to New Zealand, and brought my wife with me from Ireland. Since we've moved here, we've had the, the trouble of two miscarriages, but with two beautiful children on the back of that. So, you know, everything to live for. Once you have children, it changes your whole perspective. Things, things move. Uh, and, you know, what, what my concept of well-being is, is, and this, this, is coming from a, this is coming from now. If you had asked me this two years ago or three years ago, you would have got a very different answer because I wouldn't have known. But my concept of well-being is it's, it's you as a person. It's everything. It's not just... It's not just your mental health or your physical health. It's your social connections. It's what you put into your body. It's what you get your body to do. It's the sleep you take. It's the movements you make. It, it's everything. It's a, full, it's a full package because every single one of those things affects something else in the chain. And if you don't have that balance, it's going to lead to, it's going to, lead to problems. You know, if, if you focus only on your family and don't care about your work or your career, you're not going to be able to support your family. If you only focus on your career, you're not going to have a family there to, you know, so it, everything, everything's linked. And another, another way I look at uh, well-being and especially the likes of, we, we talk about mental health and I've heard it said a few times, and I'm a big advocate of it. I don't like the term mental health. I, I talk about a mental injury because if someone gets injured at the gym or gets injured playing football or playing rugby, that's fine to talk about. Oh, you get injured on the weekend. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. How long are you going to be laid up for? What's the diagnosis? What's going to happen? You walk into your workplace with a cast on your arm. People will sign your cast and congratulate you for breaking your arm. But you walk in and you're looking down or depressed. People will avoid you like the plague because they don't want to open that can of worms. We need to start having those conversations. Uh, a mental injury isn't a permanent state of mind. It's, not, it's something that can come and go. And just opening up and talking to people about it. Sometimes the people with the, the mental injury aren't able to open up, so just asking the right questions can make all the difference. And you know, we say when people are in a bad place, for them to reach out and get help. I have been in a bad place and I didn't even realize I was in a bad place. So 
people need to reach in as well as people reaching out. And a, a very good example of that is, I mean, I would say some of the things I have struggled with are depression, uh, anxiety, stress, and PTSD. Now, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. And what I like to say to people, it's, it's a quote from Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor. He says, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal event is a normal thing. COVID-19 is an abnormal event. So if anybody's having an abnormal reaction to what is an abnormal event, get help. Talk to people. Uh, and it's, it's the same. I've been in New Zealand and I absolutely love the country. I love the people. But living in Christchurch, uh, they've been hammered. They've had earthquakes. They've had the mosque shootings. They've had, you know, we've, we've had White Island. New Zealand as a country has been suffering for a long time. And coming from Ireland, we're, we're taking our own sufferings with us. But we're actually, we're very empathetic people. So we're taking that on. And as a firefighter, that's something that I have seen as well. Uh, you know, the, there's, there's sort of the cumulative trauma. People, these things build up and build up. The first thing that happens doesn't necessarily become an issue, but as they build up and more things happen, it starts to become an issue. It, you know, we, we reach capacity, but in the, in the negative sense. Uh, and things that I started noticing a bit like, uh, a bit like Dara, I was, I was self-isolating without even realizing it. I was spending all day thinking, I can't wait to get home to my kids. I, I just want to get home and spend time with my family. I would park in the driveway and spend 20 minutes on my phone or half an hour on my phone because I wasn't ready to go in and see my kids. But I'd spent all day thinking about them. But that self-isolation thing was there. That was actually overtaking my desire to do what I wanted to do. Uh, and just a, a tool that I'll, that I'll share now that, that I found was a very powerful thing. Uh, I think it was Brendan Burchard talks about transitions. And what I explain to people is, I look at doorways as a transition point. So what I started doing was whenever I got to my front door, you leave the stress behind. But once you step over that threshold, what I used to say to myself, right, I'm going to be the best husband and best father I can be on the other side of this door. So you open the door and you're actually taking that physical and mental step of being a different person on the other side of it. You're not changing who you are. You're not, you're not hiding anything, but you're flicking a switch in your head saying, okay, you need, to, you need to deal with what you're carrying here before you go into the house. You go in, you become a different person. And you know, I had to make that conscious decision to be a different person on the other side of that door. And as I said, I, I, got to, I got to stages where I was very close to making silly decisions. And what worked for me was actually helping other people. Uh, I think I mentioned to you guys when we were talking about the call, I, I shared a very powerful video on my, my social media. And it was a, a three-year-old girl lying in bed crying, looking for her dad. And it's, it's harrowing to watch. But shortly after I shared it, a very, very good friend of mine who's a real joker, you wouldn't imagine any form of, you know, mental injury or mental illness or anything like that. He messaged me and said, I needed to see that today. And of course, I called him. And the strange thing about the, the likes of the firefighters, I could actually tell he didn't want to talk about it, but he just wanted to know that there was somebody there that knew where he was. And we, we, we've, we've sort of acknowledged it a few times. We both know the position that we were in and what was happening. He didn't want to talk about it, but he just needed someone to know where he was. And from that, he's built, he's built himself back up. And that's what we have to do. If you are at that point, you have to build. Uh, things, things that I do, I mean, Dara mentioned as well about the, the reading. Th this is why I'm, I'm sort of doing Titan Wellness as well as the firefighting, because once I started researching it and looking into it, reading into it, following it up, you realize you can change these things. It's not an easy process but it can be changed. So if someone is feeling as bad as I felt, they need to know what I know to get themselves out of it, or they need to know what I know to pass it on to someone else. It, you know, we, we can change these things. Uh, you know, again, a couple of, a couple of interesting stories, the, the accumulative effect of trauma and stress and pressure. I, I know back in Ireland, a firefighter who was, I think he was 37 at the time, he had citations for bravery in his career. 
had dealt with all sorts of incidents that you, you couldn't imagine. But he turned up to a car accident and it was a sole occupant in the car who was a 37 year old male. And he had obviously been uh, dead on arrival. And that was the last call the guy ever worked on because turning up to that call with a 37 year old male, he couldn't do the job anymore because he hadn't dealt with the, the trauma that he'd been carrying from previous calls. And I actually spoke to a firefighter in Wellington in exactly the same position. His son quit his firefighting career after maybe 18 or 19 years based on one call, even though all throughout his career he had dealt with all sorts of stuff. And, and that to me is the well-being side of things. They're not, you know, I, I talk about, I, I usually draw a graph and explain it. You spill your coffee in the car on the Monday morning. People think that's the worst thing that can happen to them. And, you know, you stub your toe on the bed. These things build up and build up. And then you, you get your big jobs. And that takes it a step further and a step further. And it gets to the point where you just, you know, you're boiling over. But if you deal with the little things, it just gives you that little bit more room for the bigger stuff. The bigger stuff's always going to come. But it's how we deal with the small stuff that allows us to actually deal with that larger stuff that's there. Uh, you know, other things that I do. The meditation. I know if I could meditate every day, I would be in a completely different level. If I meditate once a week or twice a week, that's good for me. But the benefits that I get from it are amazing. And I, I like to look at meditation. It's mindfulness. You mentioned mindfulness to people and the visions of someone floating on the side of a mountain with their legs crossed in the lotus position. I've explained to guys, it can be you sitting on the river fishing. If you're sitting there in what I would call a relaxed state of concentration, you're meditating. They don't realize it, but if you're sitting there watching a fly on the river when you're fishing, that's meditating. You know, being, being where you are and being aware of the fact that you're there is being mindful. It's, it's not complicated, but people are scared of, you know, the, the jandal and sandals approach to wellness has scared people off. So they need to, they need to realize it is a very, it's, it should be part of who we are. It shouldn't be something mystical or magical. It's something that anybody can actually grasp and take hold of. Uh, another thing that works for me is I'm a big believer in keystone habits. You get a habit that works for you and it'll lead on to other good habits. So for me, it's, it's exercise. If I exercise, I'll sleep better at night. If I sleep better at night, I'll get up brighter the next morning. If I'm up brighter, I feel better. If I'm exercising, I'm eating healthier just as a, a side effect. I'll hydrate more. For other people, it could be if they eat healthier, they'll want to exercise more. And because they're exercising, they'll sleep better. But there is this huge knock-on effect. It's taking one good step, finding a habit that works for you and keeping it going. And it ju just leads on to more good habits. And those good habits lead to you know, better, better well-being all around. Uh, and... The support network, that's another key thing. Having those people in place that are there to catch you. Uh, I was very, very fortunate that I'd always had passion for the fire service. When I came to New Zealand, I joined the local brigade. And I remember it was actually during the time of the Rugby World Cup. The first two games, uh, me and my partner went and watched in pubs that we didn't know anyone. We just walked in at random, didn't know anyone. The third game, I had joined up for the local brigade on the Thursday or something. And they said, look, come along, we'll watch the game. We came along and were treated like family, you know, two days after joining the brigade. And that's, that's having that support network in place. It just happened. We joined the brigade. We had a family. When we were moving house, they were moving house with us. When we needed babysitters, they were there. I know it's very difficult for the Irish coming across here because the support network isn't there to fall into. But taking steps to find one that works for you will will pay dividends um i suppose another couple of quick ones to go through are you know what what advice do i have for others uh for me one of the big things is when you're in a good place that's when you need to plan for the dark times because whenever you're in a bad place you're not going to see the way out you're not going to start putting plans in place you're not going to take action you need to put those plans in place <clears throat> prior to needing them it needs to be if if this happens or i'm in a bad place i need to contact this person or even talk if, if you know you suffer from these things talk to your friends and say look if you don't hear from me in a few days or if, if i'm sort of moving myself out or self-isolating 
give me a call. I might not even answer the phone, but I just need to know you're there. Put the put the plans in place before you need them because it's too hard to do it when you're when you're suffering from the anxiety or the depression or you know whatever that might be. Uh, something that I that I do as well or talk about as a first responder when we're treating a patient, we'll take what we call a set of baseline observations, and it doesn't matter how how far they are or how healthy they are, or how sick they are. We take those baselines when we see that person. And then they're either going to improve or they're going to get worse. Take your own baselines every day. See how you're feeling. But also look at your colleagues. Go into your workplace tomorrow or your family and just observe them. See how they are. And if they're different next week, are they better or worse? If they're worse, check in on them the next day. See if they're better or worse again. Actually take those baselines of observations and monitor your friends, yourself and your family and see how they're, see how they're coping because they will get better or they will get worse. But if you don't have a baseline, you don't know. So actually see how they are on a regular, uh, a regular basis. Uh, and coping mechanisms is another thing. You know, we sort of talk about having these plans in places. Know what works for you to get you into a good place. Uh, like again, for me, it's, it's family time. If, I'm, if I come back from a bad call, uh, some of the guys will catch up and have a beer. There's a huge difference in catching up and having a beer and going home and drinking a bottle of whiskey. So it's, it's knowing what the coping mechanism is and how it works. Know what positive coping mechanisms are for you, what works for you, what's good, and know what the negative coping mechanisms are. I mean, as I said, going home and downing a, a liter bottle of Jameson is, is a negative coping mechanism, but having a decompression session with your mates over a couple of beers, when the outcome is positive and everybody's had a chance to, to unload and decompress, that's positive. Having a cup of coffee is good. Going and hiding in the car on Facebook or whatever is bad. So having those coping mechanisms in place. And I mean, I could probably, <laughs> I could probably talk all night about this, but uh, I think that sort of ticks off about, about all I wanted to get squeezed in. Oh, fantastic, Kevin. Yeah, fantastic, man. Far, I think really great, um, great insights uh, and some great advice. I, I, I'm taking away some real nuggets there, mm. there myself. I, I do like the idea of, of dealing with those small things so you're in, in a better shape to be you know, dealing with big stuff when they come along. Your, your, your theme there about reaching in and, mm. and emphasis on, on support that sort of struck me back to, to your own story, Dara, as well about you know, the, the, the role that you're your, your closest friend, your wife played and actually take, you know, taking by the hand to the GP and doing that step. And, mm -hmm. and your, your comment, I guess, Kevin, that sometimes when we're, you know, maybe when we need help the most is the time that we're potentially least, least likely to ask for it. So, so how do we build up those type of, well, so a, a question to you both. Um, how do you think you, you build up the sense of, um, uh, with the people that you know that it's okay not to feel okay and therefore you are reaching out to each other and you do have the potential of that support coming to you when you most need it. What are, what are the things that you do there? Um, I, think, I think around, around any great relationship there's trust and there's a sense of safety and certainly um, <clears throat> I'm I'm quite fortunate that, that I have that type of relationship, you know, with my wife, um, and kind of the, the way in which I solve problems is, is I actually talk. Um, it, it, you know, there are people who actually they do the polar opposite. They they talk internally, but they never actually um, they never actually um, express that. And 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 so for me, that was ne never really. Um, an issue and that I, I would always have I guess that degree that degree of 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 of, of openness um, um, around that but if there's one thing that I that I certainly have learned uh, even like I've worked with multiple people in a high performance context that actually live and operate at the edge so they're they're operating full tilt um, high demand they've developed high capacity um, a high degree of, of um, of, of resilience and but but certainly there's a fine line between um, operating at that edge and going over that edge and and um, what I've always learned to do if I have any sort of a sense that somebody's not well is to ask the question don't be mm. afraid to ask the question mm. um, how are you how are you feeling 
Um, and based upon the reaction around that, um, literally, you'd be surprised how people mm. open up. So, you know, that quality question, um, you know, how are you? And, um, you know, and if it does get to a point where your intuition is, is kind of becoming stronger, um, have you thought about taking your life? Mm. Mm. And, really you know, important to and, be able to really, really important to be able to, yeah. like you say, ask the question, show you care and, 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 and have get, get, get to that mm. point of having those hard discussions. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I just add in there as well? Yeah. So I, I volunteer with Lifeline myself. So I take calls um, a couple of times a month and, and like evidence and research shows that by asking that question, it is not putting thoughts into people's heads. It is not. You, you know, you have to ask that question directly and with, with knowing from your heart that it's coming from a place of love and kindness. Mm -hmm. Um. And if you look someone in the eye and ask them that and they say no and they're horrified, great. <laughs> and if they say yes, thank God you asked because now you're there with them and you still don't have to fix it. Mm -hmm. Just sitting with them and, and talking and being there and just being that ear mm -hmm. is, is what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the power of showing, showing that you care. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you, you, you were talking about effectively, you know, baselining other people and, and, and yourself. And I guess that's, that, that's sort of giving you the criteria by which you might reach out to somebody else to say, you know, to, to ask the question and to show that you care. Mm. Um, I, I, think, I think by just normalizing that practice that these are conversations we have with each other in, in, a, in, in a workplace or in any community is a really powerful thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, Dara, Dara and Fiona have both said it as well. The direct question isn't, you know, it, it, it needs to be asked mm. because what happens is we're actually, we're conditioned. If someone says, are you okay? We're conditioned to say yes, regardless of whether we are or not. If you say to someone, are you okay? They're going to say yes, because mm. it's, it's become habitual. What, what I actually try and enforce with people is, you know, call out on an observation don't say are you okay say i've noticed you're not doing your whatever you know i've noticed you've missed a few of your football sessions or i've noticed you know you're you're not spending as much time doing x or y is everything okay you know actually lead into it because if you just say are you okay mm. you think you're just asking to be polite mm. but I aim the question at something and say you know, I've noticed you're not yourself recently, or I've noticed you're you're getting a bit angry. Is everything okay? Mm. Uh, and another thing as well with those conversations, this is it, it actually works on both both ends of the scale. Uh, I love the I love the the Maori word mana. If someone has mana, and they open up and talk about their issues and problems, that makes it so much easier for everybody mm. else to follow suit. So, because someone with such mana has experienced or expressed their issues. Mm. On the opposite side, I've sat in a room with some very hardened firefighters and we were sitting around having a chat and the recruit mentioned, like the, the, the guy that had basically joined a few months mentioned that he'd been to a counselor for a bad call out. And for me, the bravery that that showed mm. was phenomenal because mm. it started a conversation with a group of men Mm. We probably didn't even know there was counselling services available. Mm. And I would say some of those guys probably went off in secret and went to counsellors. Mm. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing you went and got help. But that then goes back to those guys had mana but didn't have the courage mm. to stand up and either get help or share the fact that they've got help. So both ends of the spectrum, if, you've, if you're in that position of power and authority, mm. let people know that you're, you're weak and vulnerable too. Yeah. If you're in the... Mm. the lower positions the juniors the recruits let people know that you're struggling and share your experiences and you can actually you can help them you it, it can go up as well as down mm. the interesting yeah. what you say there kevin you know about um leadership and um like about hierarchy and actually like that's my theory my my theory around leadership is actually leadership is not about titles and corner offices and that's a, a big old Brene quote there as well with a few Brene fans in the house this evening oh yeah but um but yeah that actually we're all leaders regardless of hierarchy we lead ourselves we lead our families we lead our kids we lead our colleagues um 
you know, and, and vulnerability is at the core of that leadership, not vulnerability being full disclosure on telling you everything about me, but vulnerability around a, um, a willingness to show up and to show ourselves kind of authentically, just like each one of you have this evening, you know, and, and many men would shy away from using the words like beauty and kindness. But I actually would like to acknowledge and appreciate that what I have experienced here with you three this evening has been beautiful. And, you know, and that's amazing and a beautiful vulnerability um, and, and leadership being demonstrated mm -hmm. here. So that's my observation. Thanks, Fiona. Like it, 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 it is, um, it, 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 you know, I guess when you look at that, that masculine stereotype, you know, mm -hmm. I actually think we're in the middle of redefining courage and strength um, in the current, um, in the current age that we're in. And, um, and I think we're seeing that in general, like I, I think across the world, like why does Brene Brown have the following she has, you know, she, mm -hmm. Um, famously spoke um, from the heart regarding her experience as a researcher around the whole science around vulnerability mm. and um, and this was a lady who who eas wasn't easily um, accessing vulnerability in herself which she found a real challenge because mm. of what she was studying and her first ever t TED talk was 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 incredible um, just building on your point just regarding you know personal leadership and self-responsibility mm. like for, for me when i think of responsibility i think of like the ability to respond mm. um that the whole notion of responsiveness and i and i think studying ourselves like i believe provides all the books we need like w when you look at what do we do when we're squeezed what do we do um when things become unbearable mm. what are our habitual defaults and what does that really say about ourselves and 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 i think that's one of the things that <clears throat> became really apparent to me last year was I, I am not my thoughts or my actions really I, like so my i have an intellect behind you know whatever intelligence i have what, whatever brain i have upstairs i, I have a, a, an inbuilt inbuilt um intellect that allows me to control myself um, mm. And I think that's that's what mindfulness does. It gives you the opportunity to study yourself and how you typically respond um, to the to the world around you. Because you know, um, last year, you know, a, a lot of my teenage instincts around being a high achiever were absolutely quashed. Um, I grew up very very quickly and mm. really mm. really probably became um, a, a fully fully responsible dad. Uh, and really thinking around me and what's in my family as opposed to just with the singularity around mm. career and wanting to be part of something that's world class mm. you know I, I think as Kevin has alluded to all of that's worth for nothing if you end up um, as an island um, with, with no connection around you and no meaning so mm. um, so yeah I think your point there just regarding leadership it starts with you it starts with ourselves um, life is shit. Life is tough. We all die. We will get ill. Mm. We will lose people. We will experience. So, so to what degree are we really set up in terms of our mindset around dealing with these things from the outset? And mm. I, I just look at the, the role of technology, Facebook, LinkedIn. It's building all of these illusions which are, are the perfect recipe for disillusionment, depression, anxiety, uh, um, and I think with, with the movement, like the movement that Brene Brown has started, people are just looking for something that's more wholesome, more yeah. sustainable than that, and, more, and ultimately more human. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think just some of the, some of the points you, you touched on there is the, the likes of understanding yourself. Uh, one thing we need to be aware of, especially with the likes of mindfulness, is once we can actually get a grasp of ourself, our self-control, self-discipline, our, our brain wants the best for us, mm. but it's basing that off evolution thousands mm. of years ago. It's trying to protect us from saber toothed tigers and you know all sorts of stuff that we don't deal with now. Mm. What we're finding now is our cell phone will ring and we'll get the same levels of anxiety as if we're being chased by a tiger <laughs> because we're, we're, our body can't process this. So we need to actually get 
get those stressors and put them where they belong. Is that a telephone that's call? That's why I love your. Um, that's why I love your 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 earlier um, uh, discussion, Kevin, where you were talking about that conscious step of getting outside thoughts and feelings by having something like transition at the doorway, such a great mm. sort of anchor to have that I don't have to just nice. roll along with what I'm feeling. I, I, can, I can be conscious of this. I can set up anchors for myself to, to trigger, to decide to be a different way. Mm. Yes. I mean, look, stress, stress is a good thing in small doses. Mm -hmm. You know, stress is what keeps us alive. Stress is the reason the human race is still here. Stress is what helps me do my job when I need to, when I need to do it. But if I'm getting stressed every hour of the day, there's a problem. So I need to look at myself as why I'm getting stressed. Mm -hmm. It's not the, you know, we talk about what affects me and what I can control and where they meet is what I need to actually deal with. Mm -hmm. What I can't control and what doesn't affect me doesn't matter. But what affects me and what I control that's what I focus on. You both talked about there the responsibility and being intentional and being conscious. And Brendan, you mentioned it there as well. And 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 that's that's the core really of of a lot of the work that I'm doing around as well at the moment is, you know, we're so reactive. With the world is happening to us, life is happening to us. How about we happen to life? How about we own our our life we own the things we do we own our thoughts and feelings and actions and and we create the lives that we want and knowing that as you said before you know things go up and down so i use this metaphor of um you know the in we all watched er you know you know you remember the heart monitor you know it goes up and down it goes up and down that isn't mm. just you know a sign of life in that medical setting in er it's a metaphor for what life is life has mm. peaks and troughs mm. It goes up and down, you know, and it's knowing that they don't, they're neither are permanent, but it, look, listen to this, like when it goes flat, what is it? You're dead. Like, so it does have ups and downs, deal with it. It's how we cope with those ups and downs. And, 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 and you've all shared some really great ways to do that. But I, I do think that's a really great way to um, explain it. But yeah, let's just own our lives and own our thoughts and stop blaming other people. And, you know, take responsibility instead of reactivity and be and be and be fearless be fearless around the things that need to be challenged as well because you know another person's plight is another person's stress as well in in that and we see this in work environments that are toxic that aren't very well led where you know people have been asked to do more with less um um, so that point, uh, just regarding identity, mm. who am I, why am I here, what do I stand for? And, and you know, that's why I guess since I've come to New Zealand, I've come to really love um, Tikanga Māori mm. and, and, you know, I spent a week on a, on a, on a ferry in, um, in, in, in Gisborne and literally we three facilitators bring, you know, myself and, and 12 coaches through an inner insight into terms of how they have a human technology inside the house regarding mm. the three pillars that keep the house up you know the back pillar and the back wall is around uh, purpose and um, the middle pillar is all around wellness and aroha um, and then the last pillar before you go out the door is how do you bring purpose and wellness to life in in the world outside of the house mm. and it builds off this frame of me and the world around me um, and that you can go back into the shelter of the house and reflect tidy up the back wall of the house, make sure you're clear on your purpose and your intent, and then go back out into the world. And so what we were trying to do was teach the coaches this indigenous human technology that's there 2000 years, mm. uh, um, that ultimately is, is, is sitting packed inside a beautiful, rich culture. And, and mm. um, we, took, um, we took a huge amount from that. And it goes back onto that read and respond to the reality that's 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 ultimately around you so that you are not defined by your context you're defining the context and i think mm. that's a really nice challenge uh fiona that you've put into the conversation that i completely agree with mm. yeah interesting interesting to have those tikanga values and 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 the way the fari is is 
uh, used like that, it gives gives such definition. And to tie that in with with that that bit of wisdom that Kevin had in, you know, the the mm. importance of doorways and transitions, and the fact that you can mm. you can attach Beautiful. useful Beautiful. meaning Beautiful. to bring a different level of consciousness to things. I love mighty the, job, the Brendan. Way those two things sort of <laughs> together, yeah. Brendan. That that Brendan. There's DJs that couldn't have put that together. <laughs> oh, oh, Jesus man. Christ! Phenomenal, <laughs> brother. Spot the goer, man. Up, so to the boy. Oh, oh, guys, outstanding. <laughs> That's, I, am, I am. This, this this could very happily continue for a oh, long no. time, and I look forward to finding other forums for it to doing. Mm. I'm I'm very conscious that that, that Dara, you like myself, will be thinking about bedtime and making sure that we get the extra hour in yeah. every night. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I, you know. Kevin, uh, you introduced earlier on the concept of mana, and I'm and I must say, just listening to the three of you, um, mm. there's just a great sense of mana from each of you, and I'm, I just mm. thank you, thank you very much for your for your generosity, mm. for your wisdom, for your openness. Um, great yeah. people. Um, really look forward to any other opportunity to um, yeah. to catching up again. So uh, thank you for a great session. Yeah, thanks, thank you, Fiona, for organising it. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, um, I will definitely be looking for an excuse to continue this conversation. Um, <laughs> and I don't think I'll need, uh, I'm sure we'll find something um, because I think there's, there was just so much here to um, continue with. So let's, let's uh, keep in touch. But yeah, thank you all very much. Um, and this, as you say, has been recorded. So in the next couple of days, I'll get on to editing it and making that available on the Friends of Ireland. Um, on the Friends of Ireland um, well-being resource and we'll make sure to share that wider as well because that's the thing with this program or with this service it wasn't just about what we can do right now we wanted to also create something that if someone looked at in a year's time it would still be relevant or five years time you know so this is a legacy um, for our Irish community not just uh, a one-off tick the box exercise so thank you for being part of it. Very welcome. Thanks a million. Guys. Good night. It's a real privilege. Good night. Thank you. Well, Good night, everyone. Care. Take care. Slow on.